So welcome back, everyone. That was a wonderful, wonderful film. And uh, Stu, did you want to talk a little bit more about your work? And, and I know that you have an upcoming film uh, around COVID. Did you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, usually people want to know where everybody is now in the film and what we're up to. Um, we've, we've lost a few people uh, in the 10 years since the film has been out. Uh, Lois just recently passed away. Um, uh, but Lois and Sherry were able to stay in their home for a long time before they moved to a, a community of, uh, that was um, a life planning community, which was uh, very supportive of their work. And they continued their advocacy work among the other residents there, which was cool. Mel uh, is an aging advocate now. He speaks with us often and, um, and also is a BLM activist now as well. So um, it's interesting to listen to him about his evolution. Uh, uh, Chris Ann, you saw there, unfortunately passed away in the film. Lawrence and uh, Irving, the gentleman that you saw there at the library poetry reading, they are still together and they live in Florida, <laughs> happily ever after. Um, they got their we, period, ended yeah. the we ended the film before we could uh, include that. Well, thank I could you. go on if you like about <laughs> what we're doing now, but maybe that's for later. Okay, yeah. Um, and Julian, would you like to talk about your work? I know that you haven't said anything at all about yourself and your work. So I would love to invite you to, to speak more about that and, and explain about the trainings that you do and, and the wonderful work that you do here in Montreal. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Stu for uh, this amazing, uh, this amazing work that, that was a very amazing uh, documentary, that's for sure. And it really struck me because um, it's a very good illustration of the situation we have uh, here in Quebec and Canada. Um, some parts of the movie were very similar to people that I work with, um, LGBTQ plus seniors, and also some comments from uh, people working for the coast, like people working you know, in health services, for example. At some point, someone says, oh, but uh, we treat everybody the same. What's, what's the point of... Um, of you know paying attention to sexual and gender diversity in senior uh, settings, and that's exactly the same situation we have uh, here in Quebec. What we do uh, with Fondation Emergence is we provide um, training sessions for workers offering services to uh, seniors, and also for seniors themselves, like workshops about sexual and gender diversity, and we also provide those environments with like a whole um, like a toolbox, you know, with posters, stickers, a traveling exhibition. We have some video clips. We have an information guide that I could uh, share with everyone. And it's all available in English or uh, French upon request everywhere in, um, in Quebec and uh, elsewhere, of course, why not? And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what we do. And I think that's a great resource to, um, to, uh, to trigger someone, someone was saying in the com commentary that it was a triggering fear, uh, which I can I can see that uh, unfortunately. But sometimes it's also good to make people realize what the situation is like. It's the same here in uh, Quebec, so it's really important that we all pay attention to that matter for um, real. And maybe some of the people here can help us uh, um, intervene in the so in um, senior settings <laughs> to help us go in retirement homes or you know distribute our um the work that we do because once again we try to do it by ourselves like we train about 1500 workers a year on average but most of the work we do is to convince uh directors of retirement homes for example yeah you do have a 10 percent of lgbt here and if you've never heard about it it's probably your fault or maybe there's something you should uh, uh, you should maybe be more proactive in, you know, um, saying that sexual diversity is welcome here. So, um, so we get out of this vicious circle where everybody's invisible, and because everybody's invisible, nobody really pay attention to to that topic. So, thank you very much too for um, for um, addressing this uh, this situation uh, in a very subtle and a moving way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and it's it's such a necessary conversation that needs to happen. And we're all being very reminded of these conversations right now, especially. 
Um, I noticed that there is a raised hand. Edward, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. It's, it's kind of a question and a suggestion uh, directed to Stu or someone in the Clouder group. Um, have you thought about the, uh, releasing a mass market uh, DVD? Uh, I think the, um, the volume would uh, generate a, a significant income. Well, uh, without g getting, yes, we have. And uh, that would be the dream. The, that's the emotional part of, of this is we realize that the gatekeeping that we are forced to do in order to continue our social impact work and charge fees is limiting the mass audience that this might have. I will say it is on different networks at different times. Uh, I believe it's on Pluto right now. Uh, and I believe it's also on Here TV right now. So there is. Yeah, it was on Here TV. Uh, I did a subscription to Here TV for a while, and was able to view it. Uh, yeah. Before today. So periodically, uh, it does make it out into the mainstream. But what we've learned is also that that doesn't allow for conversations like we're having right now. Um, so uh, bringing people together and the conversation that comes after this, um, you know, empathy building film is really, really valuable, I think, too, and worth, um, worth maybe a few people not seeing it to have the conversation afterwards. We have a question in the chat about Chris Ann's family. Uh, what happened to Chris Ann's family? Do, do we know any follow up information that we can share? Yeah, her son went on to, to serve uh, overseas in Afghanistan and came back safely. And we've uh, the, the film has been out for a little while, so we've lost contact with the family at this point. But um, the the storyline has kind of evolved around people who are gender expansive. Uh, and so Chris Ann's representation 10 years ago is different and, and resonates differently now with people who are, say, younger and uh, find themselves uh, in a gender transition or um, uh, on, on a uh, gender spectrum of some kind. Uh, it's and and find that storyline troubling in a lot of cases. So uh, what we've done is we've decided to add things to our our website, uh, conversations with people uh, today about what's changed. Um, so I, it's uh, uh, tangential to, to your question, but um, the Chris Ann storyline is is very powerful and. Uh, it is, it, it can be triggering at times. Um, and it's hard for me to watch as somebody who lived through it as well, but th their family's doing just fine. It's good to hear. Uh, Bruce, you have your, your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah I think at one point in the film, um, <clears throat> it's um, it, with the two women, they're talking about uh, not going into residence. They don't want to live with gay people and the whole question of being ghettoized. And I'm wondering, Julianne and Sue, what you think about that? Because when I talk with members of my I'm group good. or a senior group, we do talk about, do we want to live in a ghetto? Is it ghettoizing us to want to live in a residence that's really positive or for just LGBTQ people? So it's just some comments on that. Do you want to go first, uh, Stu? Well, I think about that personally in my own life. I try to put myself out there as much as possible around, you know, I try to diversify my life as much as possible. And then there are days when I just want to be around people who really, really understand me. And um, I think that's, you know, to try to zoom out into the larger issue around that is hard for me. I don't know, Julia, do you think, do you have any thoughts? Uh, it's, a, it's a question that we have. Um pretty uh, pretty often of course it, it's tricky because like people like to trigger a conversation about that and i think it's in, in a very interesting uh, conversation you know uh, being inclusive or uh, being uh, between uh, lgbtq plus people uh, some people think it's uh, good get ghettoizing and some people think it's actually a good um, a good solution i think both approach are very valid and people should do whatever they feel like doing but i feel like raising this question sometime is um uh, not always appropriate because like right now there's no um, solution that is inclusive to LGBTQ plus seniors. I mean, there are a few options in uh, in um, in uh, Quebec, in Canada and elsewhere, but it's like not even like 1% of the offer we have for housing units 
or um, healthcare providers for, uh, for seniors. So as long as most of the services that do exist are not actually inclusive of LGBTQ plus seniors, then every solution is welcome because some people need housing where they don't have to go back in the closet or where they feel comfortable to be whoever they are. And it's not happening right now. So if anyone wants to create and go ahead here in Montreal, um, uh, uh, housing units for LGBTQ plus seniors, I'm uh, all for it because uh, <laughs> there is a, there's a need for, uh, for that. And unfortunately, there's no, the, the services that are open for everyone, they're not actually inclusive of LGBTQ plus seniors. So, so it's a good question, but right now we just need welcoming housing and it doesn't really exist so far. So every solution is uh, urgent and uh, welcome. <laughs> And uh, Julianne, do you have a resource website you can share? Resource for? A, a website that you can share for resources? Oh yeah, I can share, I can share my, the, the website of uh, Fondation Emergence. We actually have um, a directory of uh, um, senior settings and services who, um, who follow the training session and subscribe to our uh, charter of well-being for LGBTQ plus seniors. So it's about, it's about there's, 70 entries in that list. So it's not huge, you know, it's still like a, 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 a progress, uh, it's still progressing, but that's already a, a good start for mostly in the Montreal uh, region. I've just found uh, Fondation Emergence. I've put that link in the chat. It's the general website, so you can learn more about that organization. Yeah, yeah I'll send you um, a more precise uh, link. <laughs> Wonderful, and I'll, I'll send it to everyone who, uh, who was able to register for today. Um, so I have a general question. And so Gen Silent was made in 2010, that was 10 years ago. What changes have you seen? What remains the same uh, since then? What's different um, from either of you or both? <laughs> Uh, what's changed is that people think of aging and LGBTQ as the same as as a, they they can hyphenate that now in their heads. Beforehand, they couldn't. That and in our own community, we didn't. There was a huge disconnect because of the invisibility. And as much as the film is called Gen Silent, there's it, it is the it is the out and proud and celebratory nature of LGBT older people who are creating hope for the generations that are my, my generation, which, pre, which is directly preceding that uh, and, and on down the line. Um, so the fact that we, the visibility is, is, is um, much greater. We've gone backwards and we've seen that there isn't a straight line uh, in, in terms of progress that we can, as Mel says in the film, the pendulum can swing the other way. And when I made this, we made this film and did the interview with him, I thought that this was a, a person living in his fear and wasn't aware of, you know, everything was great now. And uh, lo and behold, he was right. And then I think also housing is a huge, as we've started to talk about, is really the, the major issue that is out there right now in terms of LGBT aging and of course poverty uh, is, a, is a huge issue for LGBT aging. And uh, Julian, do you have comments about that? What's changed in the last 10 years? Um, a, a similar uh, observation then um, Stu, because the, the program was created, the Aging Gay Fully program was created in 2009, so about the same uh, um, period. Um, I was not working for the program back then, but I know people who started it in 2009-2010. Most of their, uh, the main barrier that they had was to uh, make people believe that about 10% of uh, the senior population is actually LGBT. People had really had like trouble to uh, believe that or understand that. For the past four years, because I've, I've been involved with the program for the past uh, four, four years, I don't see that anymore. So people are like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's possible that we have uh, LGBTQ plus um, folks um, here with us, but it's a different kind of barrier. It's like, well, it's more like the hype behind the fact that 
you know, um, it's their private life. We don't need to know uh, what's going on in the bedroom. So no, 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 thank you. We're not going to uh, address that kind of topic. Or, um, or it's more ageism, maybe like people are going to uh, are going to um, have a position in which they assume that because people are older, they are more intolerant and they are not uh, willing to even hear about sexual diversity. So that's more the kind of, uh, we still have some reluctance, that's uh, for sure, but it, um, it uh, has like uh, different uh, origin maybe. So it is evolving in a good way, but um, I would say maybe too slowly. <laughs> Yeah, change is slow. I see that there's mm -hmm. uh, two hands up. I'm not sure which one came first, but uh, Danny, would you like to ask your question? Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, the scene of uh, the gentleman attending Pride uh, hasn't changed at all in the sense of our acceptance within the larger LGBTQ community in the sense that uh, not last year, the year before, Gang Gray uh, marched in our parade here in Montreal, and uh, I found it uplifting, and uh, uh, I was amazed at how many very young people, I mean, uh, teenaged uh, queer people who, who really enjoyed seeing us being part of the environment. So um, that is continues, I think, uh, as far as our visibility within the larger gay community. Um, I also felt th that, you know, um, within uh, social services, there's still the stigma, not only amongst uh, gay, the gay community, but also the straight community that, that older people can't have sex. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, something that that continues uh, to be there and I mean it's within our own uh, communities as well in the sense that a lot of younger people don't look at our seniors as people who are sexual um, so uh, I think that that's an issue within care facilities as a whole that people don't want to uh, deal with uh, their residence's uh, sexuality in whatever form it might be. Um, so those were the two things that sort of brought out to me. Um, uh, I've watched this film long, long time ago and was uh, just as equally moved this time uh, as I did maybe six or seven years ago because uh, uh, I found it on, online as well. Uh, so uh, I want to just say thank you to Stu, and uh, uh, I'll end my comments there. <laughs> uh, Julien or Stu, did you have any any follow up sort of comments on on like aging and sexuality in terms of acceptance? Um, your thoughts on that? Well, there is a lot of work going on. I shouldn't say a lot of work, but there is uh, awareness that sex in care settings is something that is completely invisible and very important. And not only that, the diversification of the types of relationships that we have, whether they're poly or you know whatever, that's not being talked about at all. And that's a really exciting follow-up area for me that we're exploring is how, you know, Come on, what about that? That's coming up, that's probably already there. And I've talked to people who are in non-traditional types of relationships who are scared the same way these people were 10 years ago um, as LGBTQ people. So sex in care settings is huge. And I hope I'm able to do that. I hope, let's, let's all fit, let's, that's, our, that's our action item. Let's go fix that um, and meet back here in five years. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I mean, it, it's inconvenient, right, to, because a lot of people are uncomfortable with that area of life, but we're also sexual beings for the most part. I mean, there's uh, some asexual folks out there as well, but, um, you know, there's, 
that's a part of life for many, many people. And it's a very important part of life for many people. And that's, that's another area where it's important to get comfortable with the huge range of diversity because it will, it will happen. You know, people will be there who represent all sorts of communities. Absolutely. Just to add to that, I think that wherever there's an EU factor there, it, we need to get past that. So when we got past the EU factor about two guys kissing, um, all of a sudden it became beautiful, you know, and, it, and, uh, and th there was a lot of activism movement um, and, and political movement around things like gay marriage and stuff like that. Although it was seeing older people um, care for each other like Edie Windsor, um, who really propelled, you know, movement uh, on some of these issues. And if, if we can get past the U factor of older people being sexual beings, you know, I think that's part of what's going on is young, younger people, you can speak for yourself in this, but there is generally an U factor around seeing two older people be intimate or be, you know, you know, caring with each other sometimes. <laughs> Julien, I, I've heard you have a sex aujourd'hui program. Would you like to talk? Uh, about <laughs> what, what program, sorry? Sex aujourd'hui. I, I... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Because uh, we have a Facebook group for um, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, seniors. It's a French um, speaking group because there's already an English speaking one with EGAL that we work with. And uh, yeah, we had a student in uh, sexology and uh, every, um, every month we had like a little like Facebook live talking about, uh, just talking about uh, sex and their relationships and everything involved, like you know, when, you, um, when you get uh, older as well. It's very, it's talking about uh, sex in senior settings is, all, it's, is uh, well, a, a taboo of course. And it's always like, um, not very uh, convenient for uh, us who try to intervene because uh, yes, it's a taboo for everyone and it's based in ageism, you know, uh, the, the EU factor of, uh, of older people um, having sex is still pretty much uh, here, but it's also the problem we kind of have to choose because we have to tell them, well, we don't, we're talking about sexual diversity here. We're not talking about sex. So we have to put a divide, which is, um, a little bit, uh, which is a bit of a, a pity, but we have to reassure that we're not going to talk about sex because people think about sex when it comes to a gay or, or a lesbian couple, but they don't think about sex when it's a straight couple. So we also have to deal with this component of when you're gay, bi, uh, trans, or, um, or lesbian, uh, you are hypersexualized no matter what you do. Like just by mentioning sexual diversity, people think about sex right away. So it's um, also like adding some, um, uh, some uh, stigmatization to the LGBTQ plus communities. So we're in a tricky situation sometimes because we want to help the LGBTQ plus communities. And it's easy for us to say, well, we're not talking about sex, we're talking about, you know, individuals and uh, their history, their relationships, but we also don't want to exclude sex. But sometimes, especially in senior settings, we kind of have to, uh, to choose the battle and uh, we, we choose to avoid talking about, about sex within our um, training sessions, but we do, uh, in, we, we talk about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important to recognize that there is a double standard there and, and different expectations around the different communities. Uh, so Des, I know you've had your hand up for a little while. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Let me just lower my hand right now. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily a question more than a comment. And I hope that it's going to make sense. But um, I have this friend of mine, he's my best friend. And he kind of means the world to me. Um, and I would even go as far as saying that like platonically we're life partners because I do plan to grow old with him and everything. And yeah, he's my best friend and everything. And um, both of us are pretty mentally ill, but he has a few mental illness that are more severe. And I know that a huge concern for him and a huge fear that he has is growing older and how his mental illness is going to impact him as he grows older. And um, 
I guess when I was watching the movie and I was seeing Lauren's care for Alexander and everything, while not romantically, of course, I could, it still hit close because even even at the age that we're now me and my friend, sometimes I have to be there and be able to help him. We're both chronically ill and mentally ill. So it's a struggle sometimes and we support each other a lot. And sometimes I have to be there for him, ground him, remind him, hey, we're, we're here, you're, you're in the present right now. It's going to be okay. And it's all these concerns that he has about us growing old together and if we're going to be okay living together in the future and just how and sometimes he asks me sometimes he asks me like isn't it cruel to let people love me if I know that my health will like crumble through the years and it always makes me very sad to hear that because I don't think it's cruel at all. And I guess seeing in the movie like that care through everything, it really hit me that like, yeah, I will do that for him when the time comes. Like when he's older and we're both older and we bicker like <laughs> and we bicker and everything I'll still be there for him at that time and help him on every field that I still can and yeah it just it meant a lot to see that in the movie because it also made it more real that it's going to be okay like I it when it the time comes yeah, they're really will be okay. Touching. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> while still totally, I, while it is platonic, I, I feel it's important to also, I feel it's so important to, to like platonic life partners and everything. It's such an important thing. And even if the care isn't the same way, it was still so powerful and reflective of how I want to help him and how I want this to be when we grow older. And I don't know, it just, I hope this makes sense. It's just, I'm emotional and everything is all over the place, but yeah, it just really hit close to home and to the countless conversation we've had about growing old together with me and my friends and everything. So yeah, it meant a lot. Thank you. Yeah. but their relationship is so beautiful. And I, I think a lot of the time when you're in marginalized communities, you do end up relying on each other a lot more than if you're part of sort of the dominant groups of society, because you know each other and you, you understand the ways in which you're different. And that sort of comfort and closeness is really valuable, especially when you're in vulnerable situations. Anyone wanna comment further? Uh, we have another question by Ronald. Ronald, would you like to say hi and ask your question? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, the hand. Yes. Yes. Um, I was thinking about a, another challenge in the LGBT community is um, to accept senior LGBT in the community. And I was just wondering... Um, if uh, in the past 10 years, um, question to the panel, if you sense that there's been a progress on that sense and uh, uh, what do you think about that? Because uh, I feel that is a challenge for the LGBT community itself. Julian, you go first for once, Julian or Nikki. <laughs> Um, well, it's it's to be to be honest with you, Ronald. It's a little bit hard for me to um, to um, to compare because I've been involved in the LGBTQ plus communities like for the past four years mo mostly, and uh, before that I was in a, in a different country, so it can be um, uh, tricky to uh, to to compare. Uh, but I still feel right now that there is a 
pretty much a huge uh, gap between generations in the LGBTQ plus uh, communities. Like you see that on the Grindr, you see that on the dating apps, uh, you see that in the village, like uh, people like the, the younger generations and the older generation don't really mix, for, for example. Um, in the village, like you see mostly men, like you don't see a lot of lesbians, for example. So it, it's hard, like the village is not uh, representative of, you know, the LGBTQ plus community. So it's really hard to, to, to measure, I would say, but I, I observe very much a big divide and it's too bad because uh, there's a lot of ageism going on, like everywhere and it's including in the in the lgbtq plus communities and that's it's um it's a pity because the right that we have right now it's because of lgbtq plus elders who put themselves out there for us to have uh rights by us i mean the, the younger generation and what we do today is we let them go to a retirement homes where they're not free to be who they are and some of them have to go back in the closet so uh, there's a program that we have, it's um, uh, devoir de mémoire, so like du duty to uh, remember in, in English, where we interviewed um, LGBTQ plus seniors, especially militants, so they could share with the younger generation, you know, what happened to them, what's their life story, uh, on what they were involved for this or this achievement. And um, in order to uh, reconcile a little bit uh, generations, especially with LGBTQ plus communities. Sometimes it's, I mean, it's often that we don't really have um, a very good relationship with our uh, families. It's very common within seniors, but it's also a reality for a younger generation. So since there's a lack of family within the LGBTQ plus communities, uh, there should be intergenerational bounds that should be greater than what they are uh, right now. So maybe it's growing a little bit, um, but I would see, I would love to see a, a big uh, push to that. I know that this is something that Gay and Gray is working at. We've, um, we've had a couple of events that are intergenerational on Zoom, and they've been wildly successful. People have loved them, people who come want to bring their friends, and, and so it's getting stronger and stronger each time. And that's been one way that we've really facilitated communication between generations. Uh, another way is through our podcast um, that you can find on our website. Uh, you can also just like search for it on Spotify. It's Gay and Grey Montreal podcast. Uh, so those are interviews with, um, with our members uh, who talk about their life stories, talk about their experiences, um, their perspectives and opinions. So we're trying to build bridges as much as we can so that we can build those those bonds. Absolutely. Uh, Stu, did you want to comment? Um, I was just thinking about um, cultural competency training and how when this film came out, it was just like you saw Lisa Krinsky do there at the beginning, at the end of the film, L is for lesbian, B is for bisexual. Uh, and now, you know, there are cultural competency um, uh, there's a lot of work going on around 2.0, basically, which is getting those fellow clients, residences, people that they, residences, residents, or people that they serve the, the, to, to be culturally competent. So not just the, the direct care workers or the people who are hired to take care of you, but the people who are living next to you. Wow, that's kind of advanced. But then we'll go into communities and we'll still get asked, what does the B stand for? You know, so um, it's all, it, it is a little bit geographical too, I will admit. So uh, there's, we're, we're still some, it's like a rubber band. Some places were way advanced and some places we're still back at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I see there's a couple more hands. Uh, Janice, did you wanna go ahead? Uh, sure, hi, I'm, I'm new to Zoom. So if, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool, so thank you. Um, um, there was a piece, Stu, thank you so much for your film. Um, uh, many pearls in it. Um, I was really struck, I believe it was Sherry and Lois when they were talking and um, I believe it was Sherry got, um, not, no, it was an anger, but it was, a, it was a hurt. It was a hurt by not having the respect that the elders have for being the, the um, you know, the, the, 
the frontiers, the veterans of the movement. And I think, Julian, you were just talking about duty to remember. So I, I'm, I hope I'm not repeating that kind of this, what you've already kind of answered. But what is that conversation that we could have with our elders um, so that they know that what they did is, is, is not forgotten? How, does that, how, do, how do we have that conversation to help them understand that, that um, we do respect? Because uh, I don't think Sherry felt that. Well, personally, I, I think part of that is she probably didn't feel that because she probably wasn't that connected with younger generations who, right. you know, would, would verbally and, and um, through their caring show that. I think as much as they're kind of invisible to a lot of folks, everyone else is also invisible to them. So the more we can create those bridges, the better right. off those will be. Um, do you want to talk about that? I, I agree with you, Nikki. I think, and respect is earned, they always say. And if younger people realized what Sherry had done, some of the amazing just stories. Yeah. You know, you'd walk out of a, a lunch with Sherry and just be like, oh my God, I want to be like her when I grow up. You know, like I still want to be like Sherry when I grow up. Um, so the transference, the oral history, the, the programs that you're doing where you have these opportunities to transfer our stories. Uh, because all, the other thing is um, we're not we're not inventing something new here when we go do our our um, our our activism. They've been doing it, and they're the the fountain of knowledge that we can learn from. So, um, and I'm sure they would feel respected if they if they were asked, "How did you do it?" All right, cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, there's more questions. I just want to draw attention to uh, Roseanne in the comments. Wanted to mention that it's really only now that people even realize the idea that older gay people even exist. When I was younger, I can remember myself and my contemporaries wondering what happened to older gay people because we didn't know any or see any. I think that's why it's called Gen Silent. <laughs> uh, we see uh, Edward, do you have a question that you'd like to pose? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Edward, you can raise your hand again if you if it comes back to you. Um, Are there. You there? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, we we weren't hearing you. So. I was muted. I keep they keep muting me. Um, yeah. If there's one there. <laughs> one one topic uh, in terms of sexual activity among elders. Um, in many retirement communities, there is a dramatic increase in sexually transmitted diseases. But what I really wanted to talk about was a topic that was uh, briefly covered in the wonderful film, Gen Silent. And again, thank you, Stu, for the uh, marvelous, wonderful film. Um, there's a current film out called Supernova. Um, and I'll call it the Tusker option. Um, which is basically uh, ending your life when conditions become intolerable. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I'm not familiar with the program, and um, it's a movie. It's uh, or the, or the movie. Yeah. Um, okay. About ending, you know, I mean, the question is ending in, end of life and the power to to end your own life. Um, I have not thought of. I think I'll I'll spend more time thinking about it in my own situation. Um, yeah, I'm thinking yeah. about it right now, though. So thanks. Mm -hmm. I also, I, thanks for bringing up the STDs in care settings because if you want to see proof that we aren't talking about a big important thing. <laughs> Look at the percentage of rise of rise in STDs in care settings, because nobody wants to admit that it's actually happening there. You know, definitive proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more we can admit that that happens, the more we can work to make it safer for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, 
Um, I have another question. Uh, for many of us, our homes are the safest place for us to live. So I was wondering what support exists for folks who wish to remain at home. And Julian, I think you might uh, have something to say about that. <laughs> yes, sorry, I, um, I was muted, I, I forgot. Um, we, I think it's really important to also um, uh, give uh, the training session for uh, cultural competences that we talked about before. We also give it to people who work um, at uh, home. That's actually how I met uh, Bruce when he was working for, um, for uh, Coup de Ballet. Um, so it's really important because like we know in the studies that LGBTQ plus seniors, they can be very reluctant to receive help at home um, uh, because, uh, you know, that's the only safe space that they have sometimes. And when they have to think about, well, maybe I need someone, you know, uh, for um, hygiene or for treatment or uh, for just cleaning up, uh, it's Start, it starts a process where they're thinking about removing some pictures of the on the wall or um, so, it's to, so to change their own um, their own house which is uh, such a shame because that's the only place on on earth where they feel comfortable about you know being who they are so it's extremely important that uh, people who intervene at home uh, get the training and get the awareness um, uh, people deserve. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question, Bobby. Your uh, your hand is raised. I just asked you to unmute, so you can unmute yourself and and ask your question. Okay. Uh, first, I just want to say that um, I think uh, Danny uh, um, stopped raising his hand as soon as I raised mine. So, um, uh, Danny, if you still want to say whatever you were going to say first, uh, I give you the floor. He doesn't, he's muted, so he doesn't hear me. Uh, I mean, maybe he hears me, but Dan, Danny, you're, okay, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, uh, I don't know the movie Supernova. I've heard the title. I, I, don't, I don't know much about it. Apparently it deals with, uh, I don't know, suicide, self-deliverance. Self, self all I want to say is that um, um, I wish the subject of, uh, of taking one's life at any stage, uh, and in this case, uh, as we get older, not necessarily um, just among LBG, LGB, Q, LGBTQ people, but, um, you know, I guess it could, it could, it could apply to anybody um, as they're getting older, or certainly uh, many people, uh, I wish it were something that were talked about more often. Because I mean, I find that suicide is something that's even uh, more taboo than well. Okay, it used to be maybe it's still okay. Um, uh, gay, lesbian, um, uh, trans issues are still um, you know largely taboo, but I think suicide. Is even more so, and I, I, and it shouldn't be. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't. I, I feel that it's unfortunate that um, you have to be at the point of um, uh, feeling that it's critical for you to end your life. That you're really immensely unhappy to consider suicide. It, you know, it could just be um, because you know you, you you don't see much of a future for yourself. Um, you don't have too much of a network and. Um, is it so terrible to uh, to think that put, ending your life is such a is 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 not an option? So uh, so you know I, I don't know. It's uh, I know some people would be very much against that uh, that frame of mind, but it just would be it would be good to um, to have that conversation, to have that discourse more often. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bobby. That. That is uh, a little bit out of the scope of what we're talking about, but it's it's definitely an important point to bring up. And um, I also would like to let you know that uh, Gay and Gray, we're working to um, to bring us a death cafe where we can talk about 
the taboo around death and any sort of topics around that. So stay tuned for that. We, uh, mm -hmm. we will have a space to, to talk more about that. Um, but in the meantime, I was wondering if any of our other panelists would like to speak to this. No, as, you, as you said, Nikki, it's a related issue to uh, aging in general. So um, it's not specific to the yeah. LGBTQ plus uh, communities, but it is related to everyone aging. And it's a very good question that people ask on, a, you know, as a, as a society. I, I believe there's been a few um, advances recently on the federal um, level to make it a bit more um, easy to choose not to... Um, to uh, you know, to to choose uh, you know when it's your time to go and uh, to make it like a little bit easier than it was before. So there's been some advance, but once again, it's a very um, touchy uh, conversation. And it's but it's good to have it um, on the level of a society. Mm -hmm. uh, Bobby, I was just gonna. Th I was thinking about your question, and uh, it made me think of bereavement groups for LGBTQ people, which is another like invisibility layer that we've got is that um, we can't be out about our mourning process. And I know that uh, in a lot of places they've set up really, I mean, bereavement groups, bereavement groups for LGBT BIPOC folks uh, are, you know, huge now. Um, so the bereavement, I know we're talking about end of life and right to choose and things like that, but uh, the bereavement invisibility is something that is addressable uh, pretty, you know, that's a, that's something that can be done in a lot of communities pretty easily, uh, something to think about. Yeah, and I think that's especially a, a big struggle within the LGBTQ community. So a lot of the time bereavement groups just kind of, they're open to anybody, but by doing that, the default is usually the straight community and you don't always have people aware or sensitive to um, you know, they might get surprised when you mention it's the same pronoun as yourself, you know. I'm sorry to intervene, but uh, I think we touched about that, the end of life in a movie. And uh, that's, that strike me and, uh, and, but something happened to him and uh, life changed. And uh, so it is, we, end of life could be for a medical reason or for loneliness or something like that, uh, depression. But uh, we touched it a bit in the movie, and I thought it was nice. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Julian's point about his program, because I'm going to do a pitch for him. Um, <clears throat> we used uh, the, the sensitization program with my staff. We did in-home house care. And one of the things in doing that kind of work, you realize you go into the intimacy of someone's life. And we had clients who were at two brothers, or two sisters living together and where the pictures were being held down and my staff were a little sort of unaware of things and then we took julian's training and it really really opened up their eyes it was an excellent presentation i recommend it to anybody who has access to it to take ahead to go ahead and do it there was people the thing i think you have to realize in home care certainly in montreal maybe it's the same in the states you're getting people from a whole background of different cultural issues and religious backgrounds they're going to come with a whole set of baggage and that needs to be challenged and looked at in order to provide good care for lgbtq seniors and one of the things about being an ally or a charter member is we get the charter in the office and i had ally stickers on my door and it was really clear message that if you're going to come here and work here or be part of here uh, a core value of our service was uh, pro lgbtq senior support so I don't know a whole lot of people on the screen, but if you're in service and you're dealing with seniors, contact Julianne. Uh, you can do a program. It's excellent. It's really worth your while. Um, yeah, thank you, Bruce. And as a follow-up to that, I wanted to, I, I know that there are many healthcare professionals attending this conference today, and I wanted to know um, how can health professionals support their LGBTQ patients or in, and clients? Are there any sort of like tangible actions that you can uh, suggest? <laughs> yeah, uh, Julian, <laughs> did you hear my question? <laughs> so I, I, I'm I, sorry, I, I missed the panel. So I, I was cut for a second. <laughs> I was curious about resources. Um, I mean, there's there's uh, your program. Lost you all. Oh no! Oh, I think there's an internet issue. 
I think that's what's going on. Uh, well, there's one resource that I know that I can uh, help with with folks. It is based out of uh, the US, but Sage USA has a wonderful um, in-depth uh, practical guide to creating welcoming agencies. So I've put the link to that in the chat and it'll be sent to you after, um, after this event as well by email for those who registered. And it's full of really helpful, useful tips. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I, th I think I saw it. I saw Ray's hand up, but also Bobby's hand up. Um, whoever would like to ask, I think Ray's hand is is gone now. So uh, no, I, 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 I thought to just then. on the thing about taking care of elderly people in their homes. I mean, um, to me, I was a home care worker for many years dealing with elderly people. But the different thing is, is that they were straight and I'm gay. So I mean, it's kind of like a flip. And there was no problems. I was accepted as being a gay house, uh, a gay home caregiver as a male for women and for men. So, I mean, that's why it was struck me that uh, gay, straight people will accept gay people taking care of them and the opposite. Yeah, it's interesting that double standard. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Um, Bobby, did you have a, a question? Well, yeah, hi everybody. I just, I don't know if it's so much a question, but I have to, and this makes me wonder uh, in this pandemic and being under lockdown and being under curfew and being under isolation, is that just like a precursor of what may come to pass as I get older? Because it's almost like as though I'm there already listening, watching these people's lives that have become so insulated and they're so fearful and so dependent on who uh, comes in their life because they have no control. And if anything, this pandemic has taught me, you know, how fragile emotionally and how much more, how, mu how much I need connection in my life because without that, you just are, are sort of helpless and fragile, you know, uh, defenseless or whatever. But you, so the social connection is so very important that it's, I guess, if anything, it spurs me to make sure that I continue when we get out of our curfews and lockdowns and stuff to really push myself to, to create social dynamics that I are do, but now that they're sort of diminished, it just, it feels, it's tough. But I'm looking forward to the end of the pandemic, you know, and so I, that's all I have to say. So thank you for the film. It's really touching. Very, yeah, so. That's it. Nikki, may I uh, make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Bobby, I'm I'm glad to see that we have the same desk in the background of our. Oh, <laughs> uh, heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> it's, those are heavy, aren't they? <laughs> uh, but also, I think uh, Desmond, you're ahead of me on planning for uh, you know, even if it's informally for. Uh, later, later in life. The, the question out of Gen Silent for me that you're asking, Bobby, is who is going to take care of me in the crunch? And it may happen next week, not 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And I think we all have to ask, who's our Lawrence? You know, who's going to be the person or persons? And it may not be our kids. Uh, I think we should have several Lawrences in our life. And the point about social connectivity is the subject of the thing we're working on right now, which is a film about this epidemic of social isolation and loneliness. And it builds on the story. I mean, it, it's not LGBT, part of it is, but we are all coming out of COVID just like what you're talking about, Bobby. And there are people who we've been documenting now for two or three years now who are resilient through this there was an epidemic before COVID of loneliness and, and social isolation. And um, so we hope to bring that to you in the coming months. But um, it's all about planning now for later and building your, what they call caravan of support. I love that phrase. Who is going to be with us on the road throughout life? And we have to start early. You know, uh, you can't just, Later in life, say, okay, I made a friend two or three years ago, and they're going to be the one. I mean, if you're lucky, maybe you can, but it's going to be the person you've been knowing most of your life, you know. 
Um, I, I, you can tell I get very passionate about it, but the film is called All the Lonely People. And it, it, uh, it, it looks at that, it looks at that very real concern that we all have right now. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I think some of the, the best things you can do is expand your social circle, which is what Gay and Gray is all about, right? <laughs> We're trying to make sure that we have as wide a net as possible so that no matter what, you have someone um, and, uh, or many someones, as many someones as you need. <laughs> um, I think we're, we're just about time. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. There is a survey that's being sent out to everyone to, to just do a follow-up. Please do it. It's very short and it's very helpful. Um, we also have some, uh, resources we'd like to share with you that Desmond is putting in the chat. Um, the follow-up survey link is in the chat. If you did not officially register, uh, you might not be sent it in the mail, so please click on that if you if that pertains to you. Um, thank you all so much for being here. This really uh, we appreciate this, and we hope that this is just the beginning of a longer conversation uh, of what we can do for our LGBT elders. So yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much, Sue, Julianne. Thank you. Thank you all. It was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Glad. <laughs>